Hello, uh, welcome to behind the scenes of the making of season six, episode seven, The Rangers. We're gonna start off with what inspired me, then we're gonna move into writing the script, costumes, weapons, location, and everything else. So I'm gonna throw your timestamps right here. And well, let's get into it. So the inspiration behind the Rangers, it started out with uh, the rest of the my, uh, what would you what would you call the military videos? The only they're not. Uh, so after I did cavalry, artillery, uh, infantry, and unconventional infantry, that was my uh, infantry, tac infantry tactics part one, which was conventional. Infantry tactics part two, which was unconventional. Okay, like what next? And the idea came like you know. What about special forces during that time? And like, okay, what defined a special force or an elite force? And that was, I knew there were grenadiers were considered an elite force. Uh, light infantry was considered an elite force. Uh, and then so, I'm like, but there were already videos on that. Or they're just, you know, same but different. So I was thinking about, okay, you know, what about, and that's where I drew a blank. So I started so I just would wander around, think and think and think, and then I remember listening to a video about Roger Roberts and his Rangers and how their tactics would inspire Green Berets. I'll put a link to that video in the description. Like, oh, okay, you know, that's kind of cool. So yeah, I'll do one on Robert Rogers. And then I realized I didn't know anything about Robert Rogers uh, outside of the AMC uh, television series Turned. So I did some research on uh, YouTube. And I found a couple of videos that mentioned him and explained some of the battles he fought in, but they didn't really explain who he was. And at the same time, they brought up the rules of ranging, but they didn't say what the rules were. So I'm like, okay, so what are the rules of ranging? And it was a Lionheart Filmworks or Lionheart Studios uh, that mentioned the 28 rules of ranging, but they didn't say what they were. I'd also put that down in the description as well. I'm like, okay, now I know about him, but do I really want to do another video on Robert Rogers? It seems like someone's already done this. And then so I sat down and I started playing uh, Fallout New Vegas and uh, California, New California Republic Rangers. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, let's look into that. Let's step away from the military and go into law enforcement. Were there ever California Rangers? And yes, there were. And I was like, oh, that is so cool. And this is also a fun thing I didn't know until I did more research. Uh, there's more, actually, there's more information on uh, the new California Republic Rangers than there are the California Rangers. Uh, it was a California man named Set, inspired by Texas Rangers, which uh, find, uh, found the new California Rangers. It was a California governor who hired a former Texas Ranger who would lead the California Rangers. So I don't know if that was a coincidence or if, or they actually did some research in it themselves. So good job, Bethesda. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, let's do that. I'll mention Robert Rogers and his rules of ranging because they were obviously a big part of American history. I'll mention the 20 rules of ranging because, like I said, I believe those are still used today by the United States Army Rangers. And then, just to tie it all off, I'll throw in the New California Republic Rangers. So, yeah, that's where the idea of the Rangers came from. Uh, behind the scenes of making the Rangers. Oh, one of my co-workers uh, who says he watches my channel, he actually likes what I do and he uses what I do as a way to inspire himself to make videos. He has a TikTok. I don't know what he's... I don't know what his channel is called, but if I find out, I'll throw that down in the notes. So if you want to follow him, he does like a miniature remote control cars. In fact, he got done building a crawler that looked like a... Yeah, the... He got done building a Humvee, and it was really cool, and he was really proud of it. And so, he says he watches my videos, he takes what I do, and then tries to implement into his videos. So, like, how I present myself, how I present the subject matter, and he 
he tries to do what I do, but with his own style on it, which makes sense because that's actually what a lot of channels do. They'll, you know, like their satirical talk fast genre of YouTube content creators. There are sarcastically entertaining YouTube creators. Creators. So they're not all copying each other. They're just taking what they see and putting their own twist on it. So that was the whole behind the, that's why I'm doing this whole behind the scenes thing because he's going to watch this and he's actually going to see my thought process behind it and how I do everything. All right, so I mentioned it in the beginning of the video, the whole, you know, inspiration and some of the research into it now, but to the actual research of it. Uh, when you Google Roger Roberts in the YouTube search bar, you'll get Roger Roberts and his Rangers, but not a lot on him. So I had to go to Google, Google Roger Roberts, use Wikipedia. I know Wikipedia is one of those sources that anyone can alter and, you know, add things, remove things, make things up. But I used Wikipedia for my information on Roger Roberts. That's how I found out he was a American-born colonial frontiersman. I believe he was of Scottish descent. And it was uh, him volunteering himself to, at the time, the king, to create a volunteer force of civilian military to help them combat the enemy French and the enemy natives. And him already being familiar with Native Americans himself, having traded with them, learned some of their languages, he would have a one-up because he knows how they fight. And that's why when I went to the Rules of Tactics, he says, you know, as done by the savages. Native Americans. And apparently the king gave him the go-ahead because he would create a, a experimental but obviously effective corps of light infantry that though for, would follow the articles of war would also act independently of the army. Meaning they weren't held to the same standards as the army. And in fact, some reports called Robert Rogers and his rangers the color for a colorful core because they didn't wear standard British red or they didn't wear standard British uniforms. They were thrown, their uniforms were either civilian wear or just, and they said, or, you know, Native American garb. Because Roger Roberts and other Ranger divisions, what made them unique from other militaries or other law enforcements of the time is they didn't care about race. They cared about your combat effectiveness. In fact, it wasn't, un it wasn't, unheard of for Roger Roberts to recruit uh, African slaves or Native Americans into his Ranger Corps. And later on in when we go into the future of the California Rangers or the Texas Rangers or the Arizona Rangers, it was the same thing. It didn't matter if you were African American. It didn't matter if you were Native American. All that mattered is that you were good at what you said you were good at. And so, yeah, I did that on Wikipedia. I'm like, okay, so now I know who he is. I googled the 28 rules on uh, ra of ranging in YouTube. And again, I got Roger Roberts who would create the 28 rules of ranging and they then didn't explain what the rules were. So I would go back to Google. What are the 28 rules of ranging by Robert Rogers? And boom. So I'd write those down and then obviously there was a lot. And so I would try to remember them and that obviously wasn't happening. So I would just record myself reading the rules off and then just add it into the video which you saw and then i'm like okay so i got roger roberts kind of out of the way i got his rules in there now let's go into the california rangers and the california rangers there is more on the new california republic rangers than are the california rangers and that's because the california rangers were only active from may 1853 to august 1853 which is if my memory is correct, is four months. They were only active for four months before disbanding. Well, the Texas Rangers and the Arizona Rangers have a large history because they were active from then till now. And I just thought, what would happen if California Rangers still existed? What would that look like? Because they can clear, they still have operate inside the law, but they got to do things Outside of the law, too, similar to the range Robert Rogers and his Rangers. You know, they had to exercise and act as a military force, but at the same time, they can still do things the military can't. You know, like the military cannot torture prisoners. However, Roger Roberts could because he technically was not in the military. So, what would that look like 
for law enforcement rangers. Well, Texas Rangers, their jurisdiction is where they happen to be. They can either spare or kill at their own discretion. Then. They can't do that now. Obviously, they cannot do that now. And they don't have to wear professional uniforms. Actually, a co-worker I work with, I'm not going to mention his name, said uh, one time a ranger got the jump on him, and this was a case of mistaken identity. He said, put your hands up, Arizona Ranger. And he's like, Arizona Ranger, that's not a thing. Let me see your badge. And, well, he produced a badge. that said Arizona Ranger, badge number, ranger identification. And he's like, oh, so that is a thing. And like I said, so rangers, he said, when you encounter a ranger, just surrender. They are looking for a reason to hurt you because they can do things that officers can't. Like an officer can't take off the badge, put up their hands and fight you. However, a ranger can because they are a civilian law enforcement agency. At least the Arizona Rangers are. I believe the Texas Rangers are now an official recognized law enforcement agency. And I'm like, okay, now now that we've got the California Rangers, let's throw in a little bit of NCA, uh, the NCR just for fun of it. So after I got all my research done, I would write into the Black Notebook, which would sit, also act kind of like a script because it says right here, Good morning, time of day. Welcome back to Wolf of Asgard Hobbies. If you're new, welcome to Wolf of Asgard Hobbies. I am your host, Kyle. And then that would transfer over, you know, again, good time of day. Welcome back to Wolf of Asgard Hobbies. If you're, if you're a new viewer, welcome to Wolf of Asgard Hobbies. I am your host, Kyle. And this, for the most part, they are the same, but a few things I would change. Because in... My notes here, at some point I mentioned the story behind the Rangers' motto of lead the way. Modern U.S. Rangers, I should say. I would mention their motto of lead the way. But when I actually do the video, I don't do that. Because it was unnecessary and it added nothing to the f what I was doing. Because I was, after I did Robert Rogers, it was, I was no longer talking about the military Rangers. I was talking about law enforcement Rangers. So... If those who are curious, I'll go to my notes right here. Uh, the motto, Rangers Lead the Way, comes from an interaction during World War II, June 6, 1944, during the Normandy landing on Omaha Beach. Brigadier General Norman Cota, under heavy machine gun fire, calmly approached Major Max Schneider and asked, What outfit is this? Someone yelled, Fifth Rangers. General Cota replied, well, goddammit, Rangers, lead the way. Their motto is officially, uh, and it's Latin, so I'm definitely, I know I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, sua sponte, I'll put that in the notes right here, which translates to of their own accord. But it was that interaction on that day that led to their unofficial, well, one of the official mottos of Rangers lead the way. And I removed that because, like I said, that added nothing to what I was doing. I was no longer talking about military rangers. I was talking about law enforcement. So that I just completely removed that. So notes actually helped me form a script in the form of a rough draft. And then I decided, okay, what is actually relevant to my video? And anything that I feel is no longer relevant or is irrelevant, which is the point of, you know, no longer relevant, I'd remove it. Or if it added unnecessarily to the video. If it was a form of purple pose, if you don't know what that means, it's using big words as a means to increase your word count, but actually add nothing to the conversation. And it's actually a form of distractive writing because it's unnecessary. It is to overly describe something in words that distract you from the conversation. So I'm like, okay, we're not going to do that. So I removed that. And then we went into the California Rangers. So after I got the research done, the script written, and the idea of what I want to do, the next question is always, is it doable? Well, obviously, everything is doable. But that's if you have the means to do it. And did I have the costumes? No. Did I have the uh, finances, um, money for the costumes? Yes. 
Am I going to buy the costumes? Some of them I did, obviously. And the next thing is, do I have the props? Okay, I don't have all the props. Can I buy some of the props? Yes. Can I make what I cannot buy? Yes, and I'll actually get into that later on. Location. Did I have what could be passable as location of the time? Well, I don't have a vehicle, so in terms of traveling, no, I obviously can't travel to Gold County, California to do uh, some of the Ranger video for the California Rangers. But there were a lot of areas around here that are just mountains with a lot of dirt plains or dirt or just, you know, look like a desert. Kind of, to a degree, of obviously. So, yes and no. And I've never been to Gold County, California. I don't know what the terrain looks there. So I just went to, like, into the mountains around the local area here that were within walking distance. And walking distances, depending on who you are, could be anywhere from where you live to the local park. For me, uh, I had to go five miles out of town and then one mile into the hills because you have the that you have to be one mile outside of city limits and away from residencies to discharge wet, wet firearms. So if five miles out, there's a small town. So I had to go a mile into the hills in order to discharge my firearms. Now, how did I get my firearms there? Well, some of them were pistols, which I, I know this is horrible, horrible, horrible. So... I called my father. He gave me a ride five miles to where he lives. I'm like, okay, thank you. And then I put my firearms on my miniature bike, which we see at the end of the video. And I would ride a mile out of town, out of the residency, and discharge my firearms. That was for the California Rangers and the NCR Rangers. Uh, for Roger Roberts Rangers, black powder is considered an antique and therefore not a firearm as long as it's not loaded or can be quickly loaded is okay the open carry to California depending on the officer you encounter because uh, I actually uh, there was I was at a gas station once and someone got arrested I'm like okay, you know this is a perfect opportunity so I walked up and said hey I'm not gonna harass you I'm not gonna you know pull up my phone out and accuse you of anything I just have one question I'm like okay all right so it is illegal to open carry in the state of California but I heard from I heard that I could open carry a black powder gun as long it if, if it was not loaded. Like if I didn't have any caps on the nipples, that would cause the weapon to discharge. Is that true? And he he said, I actually don't know that one. But his partner said, No, that's not okay because a gun is a gun. I'm like, Okay, good to know. Thank you. I unfortunately I asked him after I already went out into the hills. Of, walking around with a black powder gun. But now I know. So depending on the officer, because one officer said he didn't know, he he like believes it would be okay because it's not a functioning firearm. But his partner said, no, gun is gun. So was this doable? Absolutely. So now with that, let's go into some of the costumes and props. Okay, so some of the companies I'm going to mention here, I am not sponsored by. These were all purchased by me. So, this gun belt, this vest and shirt were all purchased from Historical Emporium. <clears throat> when I actually got this shirt, it was more of a, it said natural color, which if I had to describe it, it looked kind of like a hickory wood color. So I had to buy some dye and dye it green. Uh, the pants, well, trousers here, I got from Etsy by the Historical Clothing Society. I made the cartridge box, actually, and then the powder horn here, I bought at one of our local uh, gun shops who does black powder. The canteen I got from Quartermaster General, the Kentucky Rifle, the Tomahawk, 
I got from MidwayUSA.com is actually where I get most of my firearms. Uh, this leather frog here I actually made myself. I got the leather from a neighbor and then I just cut and dyed it to shape. The moccasins I also got from Etsy. Uh, this green beret I got from Walmart. If you're now looking at all of this right here, just the clothing alone was about $300. If you want to put that in hours worked, that was 15 hours of my life. <clears throat> and then the canteen was 80, Tomahawk was 30, Kentucky Rifle was like 950. The leather I got from my neighbors was pretty cheap. It was actually about 45 bucks. Now, he didn't give me just this small piece of leather. There was a lot more to it. In fact, it was the leather from this and this. I still have most of the hide. So, I've got quite a bit of leather for what I paid for it. And this was all for Roger Roberts uh, Rangers. Because like I said, the Rain Robert Rogers and his Rangers didn't have any standing uniform, but that was just his Ranger outfit. It was actually John Simcoe's and his Rangers that would have a light green, well not light green, dark green light infantry British uniforms. It was just Robert Rogers, to my knowledge, that was all civilian wear. It was brown vest, green shirts, or even, like I said before, Native American clothing, like these moccasins. And this is just what I did for the first ranger. Now, like I said, I, it, it focused mostly on California rangers, but so why did I bring up Roger Roberts? Well, because I already did the research into him, and it would be a shame to do all that research and then you, not use it. And the, you know, spend all this money on costume and not use it. So, like, you know what? I'm going to use it. This will be the first part of the video. This will be the beginning of the rangers. So here we have the uh, costume and for the California Ranger. I would have used my uh, Remington, but the problem is the Remington was uh, patented in 1858. So that would be five years after the Rangers disbanded. So that's why I couldn't use them. And it was thanks to more research I found that out. But what a lot of people loved about the Rangers is that they looked exactly like the people. And they were for the people. And if, as I mentioned before, a criminal couldn't tell the difference between a ranger or a lawman because the rangers look like everyone else. So here we have shirt. This is that natural color I was talking about. Obviously, this is done in a different style. There's embroidery on the shoulders on this one where there wasn't on the other one. And I left this one as its natural color. That was about 80 bucks. California Ranger badge. Now the one I used in filming I actually borrowed from a friend so obviously I had to return it so I bought my own Ranger badge. That was about five bucks. The leather vest, I don't know how much it cost. It was again given to me by a friend. Denim jeans and then of course powder horn, homemade cartridge box, canteen we already ran o went over. Cavalry boots I got from Historical Emporium for about a hundred bucks. So altogether, this thing cost me about 105 bucks just in clothing. Uh, the old timer knife I got from a local store here. Uh, that was an additional 30, and then 300 bucks per pistol, so 600 altogether as kit form. It would have been 500 if I bought them already assembled. 700 on the rifle. Again, these all came from Midway USA. The canteen, you already know about. The powder horn, you already know about. So this was cheaper to a degree. And this is why I would wear it when I was the California Ranger. So where the advantage was for most of the uh, other costumes is I already had the firearms. So with the NCR Ranger, not only did I buy the clothing, I also bought the firearms. And some of them I had to improvise. So, here we are with the vest. You already know I got that for nothing because a friend gave it to me. Right here is an NCR 
Ranger badge that I made is an Altoids can, polymer clay, and a paper clip. Now for those wondering why didn't I just uh, try to find and buy one, well actually I did. And most of them were the star shaped badge with a circle that we already saw that said NCR Ranger. And when I actually did my research into it, at Fallout 2, you can actually get an NCR Ranger badge. Now my issue was, I didn't know if it was a solid bar like we see, or if it came out like this and went up with wings. So, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not just going to buy a badge and claim it to be a Ranger badge, because any Fallout fan who's played Fallout 2 would know I'm lying. So I actually put in the effort to make a Ranger badge. And I also made the radio. This was actually once upon a time an ammo box. It's got pieces of leather that have been painted on and glued. Tattoo ink cap, chapstick cap, golf tee, Gatorade cap, five hour energy drink cap with a piece of tape on it. Matchbox, more leather. This was a clothes hanger at one point. And then just pieces of scotch bright that have been glued into it. Actually, I put a piece of scotch bright under this one and then put another one over it and then glued it into it. That way it has that kind of like a radio lip to it. Then I spray paint them as you can clearly see. So yeah, so the radio, the badge is homemade. The bandolier I made myself from a belt and some scraps of leather. And if you want, I'll show a video on how I made the bandolier and how I made the badge. I had to buy the shirt from Walmart, which was 30 bucks. Pants from Tractor Supply, which was 40 bucks. A hat, which was an additional 30 bucks. So that's 70 bucks right there. 110. I already had the holster for my Remington. I already had the gun belt for my Remington. These I bought from Tractor Supply, like the strap itself, this leather strap, I think there's two of them. I don't I forget how long they are, but it's like 30 bucks. The belt itself was an additional 30 bucks, so that's $60. 170. 600 for this revolver. And then a thousand and two hundred for the rifle. 30 bucks for the old timer knife. So it was more expensive for me to do the NCR Ranger. Than it was the any, any other Ranger costume. I didn't mention this, but in the uh, California Ranger, I also have the top hat. That was a costume prop, like a couple of Halloweens ago for like four bucks. But this is easily the most expensive part of the video. Outside of the badge and radio, in terms of additional props, we have this skull cap here, which this is what I put the uh, cavalry hat over. When I walk up and shoot myself. And if you. A fun little easter egg. Uh, I needed a deck of cards. Because I wanted to throw an easter egg. To some of uh, US history. And that's right here. The pairs of aces and eights. This is the hand that Wild Bill Hickok held. When he was shot in the back of his head. So when you watch the video. Where you see me. Shoot myself. If you look at the hand. You should see a pair of aces and eights. I just thought that was a fun little thing, the fun little Easter egg to throw in. And then I also drew the wanted poster. Uh, now, the face, it, it was supposed to be me. No, I don't love myself that much, but I figure if I'm going to make fun of someone who better than myself, I actually have really bad self confidence issues and self esteem issues. I'm also, what's the word? Not self confidence. Conscious. I am self-conscious of my appearance. I don't think I'm a very attractive man. Anyhow, <clears throat> I would draw this out in pencil, and then I would go over it with pen, and then I'd use marker to darken some of the areas. And how did I age it? I would take a tea bag and then just drag it across the paper, let it dry, and then I'll take the same tea bag, let it get wet, and then I'll throw it, and this will leave space. Blatches. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, right here. Yeah, that's the impact from the tea bag, and then I'll just let that dry again. And now that we're on the topic of tea, uh, my whiskey that you see me drink is actually just tea. 
And that's because I don't condone drinking and shooting. If you're going to drink, do it responsibly. If you're going to shoot, do it responsibly. responsibly. Never do both. Alright, so let's go into some of the uh, other... What would you call it? They're not props. Anyhow, let's go into some effects. Let's go into the effects of how I shot myself. So, the scene where I shoot myself, I actually have a glove, rolled up pieces of paper for the fingers, this is the palm, this bottle acts as my forearm, and then my head. So, let's put the hat over this cap. Place it on the phone stand. Build my thumb. Build my index finger. I already have the other three finger stuff, my pinky ring in the middle. Now my palm. We're going to crush that down a little bit to get some volume. This acts as my forearm and also additional hand support. And this stick we're going to put through the ring finger. Actually, no. We'll just put it through here so it holds it. Now this tape actually marked where I had my hand set. So that way when I put it down, it's in the same spot. And the stick holds it in place. I taped my cards together and put some tape on the thumb, forefinger. Now we're just going to hold the cards. And then for the whiskey, as I already mentioned, I just use tea. And this is how I, if it cooperates. Extra tape. So this is how I essentially shot myself. So it's not exactly how it has set up, but this is the angle where you'd see the gun come up, hammer come back, and you see the hammer fall forward. And then, yeah, this is how I once again, shot myself. So, why did I do the um, lever action twirl? Well, that's because uh, John Wayne is one of my uh, action heroes as I was growing up. And to do that, you want a large loop on any lever action. It could be a Henry, it could be a Winchester. First things first, treat all guns if they're loaded, second confirm. So we're going to open up the loading tube, we're going to rotate this S, come up, nothing's coming out, drop the lever, because sometimes a round, you might have a surprise round, nothing ejected, nothing fell out, always practice with an empty gun, put the tube back in. And how it works is when you, you want to have three fingers inside the loading, um, inside the lever, you're going to push out on your first knuckles, and then you're just going to let gravity do the rest. And then you're just practice like this. I would, I would suggest you practice like this first. You're going to punch out, let gravity and momentum do the rest. And once you get good at that, you can just hold your arm out. And you can do the same thing sideways. I did that as an homage to John Wayne because that was my action hero. And the shooting off the bike, I didn't practice that beforehand. That was as that was on the spot. You can't see it. So let me lower you down a bit.
I'm having issues with my stand at the moment. Right now that I have my stand fixed, uh, you just see when I was riding, but when I was riding, I had my revolver in the holster, at butt facing out. There you go. So I had to cock my arm a little bit, come up, and then pull the hammer, and same thing, practice with an unloaded revolver. Push this pin, pull this pin out. Open up the loading gate, barely rotate, barely pull back on the hammer, cylinder is empty. Barely pull back, goes in, close the loading gate, push button, put pin back in. Alright, so. So like, you didn't see it, but I come up, pull the hammer back, and then it was just, got my timing wrong was all. Because as I mentioned in my Calvary video, you want to have the hammer back, and by the time you pull the trigger, the hammer should fall, igniting the round, hitting the target. I shot too early, only moved one, pulled the hammer back, shot too late, and then I missed the second one entirely. Now to get the break on, what I did is I moved it from the pad of my finger past the first knuckle, let it fall back, and when I squeezed the um, break, it would fall forward, and that was it. Then I would come up, put the revolver in my holster, and my uh, Henry rifle was on the left-hand side, so when I'm riding, it's on this side, same side as my gun arm. So I'd get off, hit the kickstand, grab my rifle, pull it up, rotate it to my next arm, and then engage. Well, here's my parking spot. So, looks like we're walking. Still walking. Just a little more and we'll be at one of the locations. All right, here we are. One of the locations. This is Greenhorn Park. That is Greenhorn Lake. It's a man-made lake. Fishing, boating, not swimming, however. The water's too filthy for anyone to actually swim in it. And there have been a... It's, Cause a few deaths too. And down there is Lower Greenhorn. But I'm going to show you the best part of this place. This here, this is the best part of the park. We have some of the old buildings from Marika. In fact, I actually thought about using some of it as the backdrop for my video. Then I realized, you know, well, they might be accepting of the vest, the hat, the badge. But I don't think they'd be very accepting of me having guns. Although I could probably have done filming here without the firearms. And here's some information. If you want to read further, I suggest you uh, take a screenshot or pause the video. Some of the old mining equipment. An old minecart, tracks, and an old mine shaft. So, even though I didn't use any of the actual park or part of the old town in any of the videos, I would use one of the trails as a backdrop. It's where 
when I explained that the California Rangers were considered part of the California Militia, which was a precursor to the California National Guard, I was actually on one of the trails here at the park. So this is location two of three. The third one's further up the hill. So the, and the whole point of looking for a location is if it's big enough to do what I want to do, because if I'm shooting firearms, I need to have a good amount of distance between me and the projectile, should it ricochet. But at the same time, if I'm trying to do long distance shooting and I only have a short range, it's not going to do me any good. But if I'm trying to shoot short distance and it's not long enough, it's also not going to do me any good. So that's why I will look around for locations or have a picture in my mind of what I'm going to do and where I'm going to do it. Because there's four different spots around here I shoot. And then when I did the whole ride down the motorbike, it was just down this little hill here. That way if I also had the target set, if I missed, they just went to the hill. So there was no putting anyone in danger or damaging property. Uh, for the music, it wasn't until after I realized it was... No, let's just get into the music. So for the music, I actually used this keyboard. You're, I pushed five zero, and it's these last two keys here that I used. And that was the, uh, I guess, music, you, if you want to call it that, that I played when I walk up behind myself and squeeze the trigger. It wasn't until later, after I produced the video, that I realized that was the Predator theme, or... Uh, or at least a piece of music from the movie Predator with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger where I believe that the scene is he's crawling away from the Predator and that was the music playing in the background as the Predator is stalking him and for those of you who are unaware I can in fact play the piano I, however, cannot sing. And then <clears throat> for the New California Republic Rangers, I wanted to use a song that I know everybody would recognize from Fallout New Vegas. And that's what led into the song um, Jingle Jangle. Unfortunately, I did get a hit with a copyright. And they didn't take it down. And it wasn't a strike. They gave me permission to use it. But I believe to avoid copyright rules, you can play music as long as it's shorter than 30 seconds. So... Something to keep in mind. Let's go into the gunshot. <laughs> Alright, so instead of shooting the gun, I'm just going to use these two wooden blocks. No sense in wasting ammo if I don't need to. But this isn't the right spot to do it because there's nothing for the sound to bounce off of. It'll just echo throughout. So it's also knowing how sound works. So to find, I'm going to try to find a spot that, look, that can work as the interior of a home. So this area is going to work better because it's more confined. So the sound's not going to travel out everywhere. It's going to bounce off the trees. It's going to bounce off the leaves. So when I did the shooting, I pulled the hammer back. I counted three seconds. And then after three, I shot it. And it's using the editing tools on the PowerDirector app that I was able to Turn that video into a sound bite, edit it out, that way I only got the sound of the gun going off. So after I got all the uh, shots I wanted shot, sounds I wanted recorded, it's down to the video and editing part of, the video, of it. So on some of the um, Ranger video, you would hear my a voiceover of myself and how I accomplished that is after I okay, let's get to the recording part uh, before I start talking in my videos I do a three second big be silent beginning then I'll say my line and when I'm done saying my line I will freeze depending on what my action is and stop speaking for a three second end, silent end and then when I go into the editing of the video I'll cut off the first three seconds, 
and the last three seconds, and that way all you get is just me talking and acting. And I could also do this with voiceovers too, because once I'm done doing my uh, video on the Power Director, you can drop that video once you've cut it in the way you want. You can also duplicate it. Take that duplicate, duplicate, drop it underneath it, and then it will convert it from image to sound instead of just uh, instead of sound and image. And then you can mute the the video, and now it's just a silent video with a voiceover. And I short and I would shorten that video by a couple more seconds depending on what I was doing. Like when I stuck the uh, badge in my vest or when I ripped the uh, wanted poster off the wall, that was an example of me talking in one whole scene and then only for me to duplicate it, edit the original, drop the duplication under uh, the video and then put the next scene in. Because like I said, when I said, and they were called the California Rangers, that, I didn't say that when I was sticking the badge in my vest that was in the previous scene when, when I was in the park. Or when I said, you know, he would also work, when Harry Love would also work as a Bounty hunter, you see me rip the poster off. I didn't say, and we'll work as a bounty hunter when I rip the poster off. That was in the previous scene where I'm dealing cards with you, the viewer, and myself. And then I also Google pictures of Harry Love and John Bickler so I could throw them up and you know who these people are. And then there's, so the top box of your Power Director app, it's your video or picture, depending on what uh, you click on the sidebar under that. And there, the second top bar, uh, bottom bar, second bottom bar is for text. And that's where you see me throw up my notes, like when I mispronounce something or I don't know how to pronounce something or I forget a piece of information. And the other bars under that are sound recordings, which I can just take an image or recording, drop that down, convert it to a sound bite. Or I can go to the top left bar, go to music, and then it'll pop up music options like from the actual, from my phone itself, or I can look up music, or I can do a recording of music, and I can record that way. And that was just the basic of filming and editing for most of the, uh, most of the episode. Although I've done a lot more with this in terms of costumes, firearms, research, and everything else, oh, which does bring me back to an important point. Uh, if you do decide to do something similar to what I do, do not go without your buy, beyond your means. Like I didn't buy everything all at once. I should have said that. I bought it one item or sometimes two items, depending on item cost, per paycheck. I already had the vest because we see me wear another video, so I didn't have to buy the vest. I did have to buy the shirt and beret, which I bought together. And then in my next check, I bought my trousers and moccasins. And then I already had the Kentucky rifle, already had the cartridge box, already had the powder horn. And so it's just buy them an item at a time, and it'll help you save money if you choose to go that route. So yeah, that's my filming and editing. Three second silent beginning, act out, talk, stop, freeze. Three second end, edit, voiceover, alter, and all the other fun tools you can do in the Power Director app. Uh, the hardest part about any of the videos is it's not the costumes, it's not performing what I set out to do, it's the it's the uncertainty. Like, you know, am I producing videos in a quality that my audience likes? Am I giving enough information about what my video is about that the audience is also learning something or is the lighting right so they can probably see what I'm doing? Can you hear me when I'm talking and like it's all at my own expense it's I can't afford to make a lot of mistakes because I have a limited amount of resources to make it up so in one of my videos someone just commented no good but they didn't explain what wasn't good about it was it you know it was about my uh, homemade percussion uh, caps they didn't say what wasn't good about it they didn't say if my technique was bad they didn't say how I made the caps was bad. They didn't say anything outside of no good. And that doesn't really help me. But what does help me a lot is I have coworkers who are also viewers of my channel who act, who give me
feedback. Some of it is, you know, criticism, which is, okay, great, I can learn from that. And some of them is positive reinforcement. It's like, okay, great, I will keep doing this. So it's one of those things I actually, I will read my comments, I will take in consideration, or I will take what my coworkers tell me who watch my episode and add that and try to implement that into my next video or change in my next video. So, you know, I'll change camera angle, I'll change the lighting, I'll change how I present myself. I won't be a slouch, mumbling, incoherent mess. I will stand up straight, shoulders a little bit back, and do a more proper and gentlemanly bow, and then present my information in the form of timestamps, and yeah. So I, I actually do read what is in the comments. I try to change what the comments say I need to change, but I also need to know what to change. So like I said, that whole no good comment doesn't do me any actual good because it didn't tell me what was no good. Versus people, you know, I like what you did, but your information is a little incorrect and then they'll, you know, put a, in the comments, you know, what was actually correct based on their research and how some of it was lined up with mine and how some of it I, well, if it's not in there, it's probably because I didn't know or I didn't read that far into it. And then I will, you know, thank you. I was not aware I did this. I will take that into consideration for my next video. So it's always the uncertainty on how well my work is going to be accepted. But that's the cost of doing things, isn't it? You can draw 20 paintings. Doesn't make you an artist until someone walks up and says, you're a good artist. You can cook 20 meals. Doesn't make you a good chef until you go to a school and then you get a piece of paper that says, congratulations, you gradu graduated from this school of culinary arts. You are now indeed a certified good chef. And it's, I don't know if my video is good until you, the viewer, actually view it and give me feedback. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I was able to teach you something, but at the same time show you what it's like on my end, because on my end, I only have one thing in front of me, the camera. And the camera obviously is not going to give me a lot of feedback in terms of what I can change and what I can make better. So, um, in terms of uh, progress with the channel, I'm going down to uh, Sacramento this October to swear in for the National Guard. I do not know when I will be sent out for basic training. That doesn't mean the channel is going to stop. That just means my videos will be less often and like they were, you know, so pop, uh, so uh, frequent to begin with. But I do have two other videos uh, planned, uh, one on the uh, Colt Walker and one on the Brown Bess. So until next time, have a beautiful day.